everyone, welcome to the program. I'm Rebecca McLaughlin Easton, and this week we're exploring pockets of our blue planet, examining the health of waters in this region. We speak to world-renowned oceanographer and marine conservationist Jean-Michel Cousteau, son of the famous Jacques Cousteau. It's the perfect time now in our history to wake up and do what we need to do. We'll also delve beneath the waves in Jordan in the Gulf of Aqaba, where the destruction of the coral reefs is leading to drastic action. But first, the French ocean explorer Jean-Michel Cousteau recently came to the UAE to help educate people about better protecting the waters around them. The octogenarian also took time to speak to inspire. We are only here as visitors, and if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself. The words of a man who has dedicated his life to conserving the waters that make up more than 70% of planet Earth. Jean-Michel's lifelong aqua adventure began when he was just seven years old, thrown overboard by his father Jacques, who strapped the aqualung scuba gear he had co-invented to his back. Jean-Michel's path in life was perhaps inevitable, given that his father was a former French naval officer who became a pioneering explorer, activist and scientific collaborator. He has more than 80 films and documentaries to his name, all themed on safeguarding the future of the planet's seas and oceans. And his ongoing research explores how holiday resorts can minimize their environmental impact. He's an animal lover with a big heart, and this year campaigned for the release of around 100 whales from captivity in Russia. And when not meeting with policymakers to push for tighter conservation laws, Jean-Michel is talking to children. As part of the Ocean Futures Society he set up in 1999 to give, as he puts it, a voice to the ocean, energizing and educating the masses at grassroots level about the world's fragile aquatic ecosystem. Thank you so much for being with me today. Welcome to Inspire Middle East. You're very, very welcome. We sit here on the coast of the Arabian Gulf. I'm intrigued to know, what do you make of the marine conservation efforts here? Is there anything you do differently? Well, there's a lot of issues, and particularly emission, emission of CO2. And uh, that, that is a problem because it contributes to the, not only the warming up of the ocean, uh, which means that as the ocean gets warmer, it dries. And because of the energy that the temperature, the added temperature provides, the hurricanes and the storms are stronger. And in addition to that, there's the acidification that uh, these uh, products are creating. And nature can take punishment to a point, and there's a point where too much is too much. And there are places where 25 to 50 percent of the coral reefs are dead. But there is a fine line, isn't there? With all the countries that you visit, you, you cannot be seen to criticize your hosts when trying to enlighten them about their environmental footprint. So how do you approach it? <laughs> and I've learned a lot of that from my father. You never never criticize, you never, never point a finger. When you point a finger, there's three fingers pointing at you. Forget about that. You try to have an opportunity to meet, and then you can reach each other's hearts. Over the years, you have called upon many countries to do more to protect their oceans. But looking at G7, is there anything you can say to convince the likes of the US and Japan to sign the Anti-Plastics Charter, for example? It's the perfect time now in our history to wake up and do what we need to do. And there's one thing, we always talk about plastic. Of course, it's a big problem. But what about what we don't see? There are hundreds of different chemicals. You take the tablet of aspirin and hopefully it takes care of your headache. Where's that chemical going? Right into the ocean. I was tested with 32 different type of chemicals and two uh, type of uh, heavy metals. And uh, we are being affected by our mismanagement of the resources. And there are huge opportunities now to capture all these runoffs and we can 
make money doing that because in nature there's no waste. Everything is a resource. Should the pharmaceuticals be taxed more heavily? Should they be fined for polluting waters? And do you ever look at the global situation and think it's just too late, we can't stop this? Nothing is too late. What we can do is to change. And uh, we have to understand that we can take only of all the species, whether it's in the ocean or on land, whether it's plants or animals, we can only take the interest produced by the capital. So tell me, is there any evidence of water babies in the next generation of the family looking to continue the work that you and your father started? My children, a boy and a girl, they're all heading in the direction of doing everything we can or they can to protect the planet. And my daughter, for example, gave birth to my grandson underwater. In the 1960s, your father was involved with projects to build human inhabitations underwater. The project didn't really float, if I can put it that way. Do you think it could one day? My father was thinking about doing that, and he had already a structure of Marseille in 35 feet of depth, uh, and there were two people living there. I found out that we, a uh, human species is not made to live underwater. We need the sun, we need the wind, we need uh, the air we breathe. Speaking of your father, can you share with me one of your fondest, favorite anecdotes? We were on a boat on our way to New York, and I was sitting next to him, closer than you and I are right now, and he was talking and I was learning and listening to him, and at some point he stopped and he looked at me and he said, Jean-Michel, it is you who will carry on the flame of my faith. Well, that has impacted me for the rest of my life. And have you said that to your son? I'm saying it differently. Talk to them, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Michel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. It is my pleasure as well, and I hope this was meaningful. Thank you. We leave the UAE's waters now and head to Jordan, where construction, climate change, tourism and fishing is disrupting and even damaging coral reefs. Rosie Lees Thompson has more on the eco-efforts being put into place to protect the Gulf of Aqaba's marine life. The underwater gardens in the south of Jordan are spectacular home to a fascinating community of plants and animals, and at the heart are the corals, colonies of tiny animals which host one in four of all marine species. That was amazing, so breathtaking, the corals and the diversity of the species which indicate how healthy this ecosystem is. But across the world, corals are dying at an astonishing rate. Overfishing, pollution, and in particular climate change has led to the loss of half the Earth's reefs. If this carries on, the impact on the underwater world will be catastrophic, not only for oceans, but the planet. Up to half the air we breathe comes from the oceans and the coral reefs within. But there is hope. Scientists in Jordan have discovered the corals in the Gulf of Aqaba are resisting the rise in water temperatures. The exact reason is still unknown, but it's believed that the creatures evolved during the last ice age more than 20,000 years ago. Marine specialist Dr. Fawad Al-Harani hopes that these species may one day be the key to repopulating the world's dying reefs. There are techniques and the know-how are existing. We can propagate corals, we can acclimatize them to conditions available in the other seas. So once we grow them, we can send them abroad where they can grow them into deteriorated area or damaged reef areas. But Aqaba's corals are still in danger. Global development and pollution are threatening their survival. Spanning a distance of 27 kilometers, this slither of coastland is the only sea outlet Jordan has. Not only is it vital for trade and commerce, but it's also a major tourism hub. Around 100,000 tourists visited the coastal city last year. So how do you encourage economic development and still protect these fragile habitats? 
when Jordan's port was relocated to one of Aqaba's largest reefs due to tourism expansion, the government, with the help of the UN, worked to save a portion of the thousand-year-old creatures. Placing the corals in baskets, they transported them two miles up the coast, where they were replanted. We get um, a great success. Luckily, we get um, a growth rate of uh, uh, more than actually 80-85%, which is, uh, uh, I would say, unique, because in literature, uh, globally, you find the, 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 the average growth rate after a translocation and transplantation is around 65. The eco-divers Abdullah and Omar believe more needs to be done. The brothers are fearful the continual development is simultaneously threatening the real draw, the reefs. Here in Aqaba, no. Our biggest problem is us affecting the marine environment as a human. And I, should, I think the government needs to enforce the law to do more awareness program, to do more effort in protecting the marine life and save what is left of the marine life. For the world's underwater treasures, the clock is ticking. With the fate of the coral and the life it supports resting in our hands. Well, that is all that we have time for in this show, but be sure to catch all of our episodes online at euronews.com. And before I say goodbye, here are some social media posts that caught the attention of the team this week. Ekaterina from Russia posted this picture of her dive to a shipwreck in Sudan. And Andriy from Ukraine went for a dive with redfish in Egypt's Red Sea.